Okay, so it is just after 3 p.m. Central Time on November 17th, 2021. My name is Rick Charney. I'm a volunteer for the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And today we have the luxury of interviewing Lawrence Fishman. And this is a, a, an attempt at gathering some information from Lawrence's past as it relates to his life, as well as the Dallas Jewish community. And we're going to jump right into it. So maybe, Lawrence, you could start with the basics of where you were born and uh, family, family members, and maybe if you want to fast forward all the way to how you got to Dallas. Okay. Uh, I was born in uh, New Orleans uh, pre-war, World War II, that is. Uh, my father. Uh, my mother, you know, let me start with my mother. My mother's family immigrated from somewhere in Eastern Europe to Canada uh, and then uh, snuck into the United States across Lake Michigan to a little town uh, southeast uh, of Green Bay called uh, Algoma. Uh, she lived there. She was born there and lived until her, uh, I guess she was maybe a preteen and then her family, uh, uh, her family was pretty prosperous there in Algoma, uh, and uh, had a nice business and nice life. But then a fire destroyed the business, and I assume there was no insurance, so they picked up and went to Waco. Uh, my father uh, was uh, uh, unemployed as a result of the. Uh, stock market crash, not that he was, in 1929, not that he was a big player on Wall Street. In fact, he was just a runner. In those days, we didn't, or they didn't do everything by computer, but yeah, he was going along, had a nice life. Uh, he grew up and was born and grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, his uh, parents, uh, his father was from uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, his mother, uh, as I understand it, yeah, obviously, I wasn't there. Um, came from a prosperous uh, uh, family in London East End. I think they were green grocers. Anyway, they came to New York through Ellis Island. My father was born in Brooklyn. Uh, he is the uh, next youngest of uh, five children. My mother was the youngest on her side. Anyway, during the Depression, uh, he rode the rails from uh, New York down to Waco. He had gotten word from a cousin he had living in Waco that he could get employment there. So he went to Waco, uh, worked on the uh, WPA, uh, building the uh, portion of what's now Interstate 35 uh, between uh, Waco and Hillsboro. Met my mother in the course of that. They married, I believe, in about 1935 um, and uh, moved to uh, New Orleans, I suspect, because uh, my mother's older brother was living there. He was a reporter for the Times Picayune and uh, since through his connection, apparently found employment for my father in the furniture business. Um, my father, uh, one of the... Uh, distinct recollections of my very early childhood. Indeed, you know, I was but a toddler around 14, 15 months old, was Pearl Harbor Day. I recall my father standing in the doorway of our little shotgun house uh, in his uh, Sam Brown belt with his uh, soup bowl helmet on. He was the block air raid warden or something, but anyway, he was going out to do his duty, and I just have this distinct impression or vision in my mind that they, I've had ever since then of that. Uh, and then, uh, and perhaps a touch of irony, uh, the day after, I recall our uh, dining room table being literally covered uh, two, three, four deep in cigarette cartons. So uh, my parents were patriotic, but... <laughs> They weren't going to give up their cigarettes uh, 
in the, in, in, in the coming war. And my father went off to fight the Hun in Europe. Um, and uh, uh, was uh, wounded a couple of times, picked up a couple of Purple Hearts, Bronze Star. He had a combat infantry badge, all of which uh, uh, makes me uh, extremely proud of him. Uh, came back, um, the same cousin that had lured him to Waco said, you got to come to Houston. There's, you know, it's booming. So he packed us up in the... the pre-war Plymouth and uh, drove us to Houston where we uh, settled and uh, he stayed in the furniture business, found uh, a uh, job with a large uh, local furniture company, Finger Furniture, that I believe is still in business. So anyway. And that would have, that would have been the early 40s. Uh, well, it would have been mid 40s. I expect we moved to Houston about 1946 because my younger brother, who's no longer with us, was born in April of 47. And that's another thing that sticks in my mind. He was born the uh, day before the uh, Texas City uh, port disaster. Uh, the cargo ship blew up and killed hundreds of people. And I remember the lines of ambulances coming up the uh, uh, Highway 75 from uh, Pasadena to uh, the hospital where my mother was uh, in, in ensconced, in couched, whatever. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, I grew up in Houston, went to... Uh, so your, your brother was born in 47 and it's yeah. just the two of you, what year, what day were you born? I was born August 18, 1940. So you were seven years older than him. It was just the two of you. Well, almost seven years. He was born in April. Right. And then after you were in Houston, what, what was the Houston life like? How close was the family? Was there any sparks of Judaism or Shabbat dinners or anything like that? Uh, and then, of my course, family, you guys moved to Dallas. My family was not uh, religious. Uh, we belonged to, uh, at first, uh, what was I don't even remember the name of it now, uh, Adath Emmeth, uh, which uh, had a temple across the street from the first house that my parents bought. And uh, that's where they uh, started sending me to Sunday school and to uh, Hebrew school. Uh, I, uh, neither of them went to services except on my, my holy days. So uh, I came by my uh, lack of attendance fairly honestly. Uh, I uh, was further, you know, I don't know exactly what verb to use, but uh, uh, I was extremely affected by, I guess, about age 10, first learning about the Holocaust. And uh, I'll just put it this way. Ever since then, I have been a uh, religious skeptic, to put it mildly. Uh, and uh, that's been uh, uh, the story of uh, my family growing up, I did have a bar mitzvah. It, uh, we moved and joined another congregation, uh, Beth Yashurin in uh, Houston, which was very close to our house also. Uh, but the bar mitzvah part was, uh, or bar mitzvah thing was mainly about the presence and about the girls, uh, which is probably still true today if you want to uh, dig, dig in a little bit. Uh, I uh, was a midterm, uh, I got double promoted one year, so I uh, was a, a, a midterm graduate uh, from uh, San Jacinto High School. Um, I uh, only wanted to go one place, which was the University of Texas. Uh, the tuition then was $50 a semester. And uh, I wanted to uh, 
join a particular fraternity, but I'll back up for just a minute and talk about the uh, teenage, junior high and high school years in Houston. Uh, I uh, was asking or talking to a friend a number of years ago, a, a professional colleague who uh, grew up in Dallas and went to Highland Park and uh, I think SMU undergraduate. Um, and I asked him one day, I said, Chris, you know, how is it that uh, you know, uh, uh, Jews and Christians uh, got separated uh, during those years and remained that way virtually ever after. And he thought about it for a minute. He says, well, you know, all through elementary school and up until the seventh, eighth grade, junior high, uh, we all were, you know, one, one group, even in Highland Park. Uh, there was no, nobody was Jewish and nobody was Christian. You know, we knew that uh, Jews didn't celebrate Easter or uh, Christmas and, uh, uh, and we didn't celebrate Passover and Hanukkah, but that, you know, it's no big deal. But then all of a sudden, about age 14, the Jews disappeared. Um, and I'll add one, uh, I'll, I'll get to why in just a minute, but I'll add one coda to that story. Uh, my wife was born in Dallas, or my late wife, or I'll refer to her as Marsha because I hate saying late wife. Um, my and Marcia was born and raised in Dallas and went to Highland Park High School. And I'll talk about her more later. But anyway, we went to her 50th class reunion a few years ago. And uh, we were sitting around a table. It was at the uh, Lakewood Country Club, if memory serves. Um, and one of her classmates, uh, her name, maybe named Jane Bach, uh, her prominent uh, Jewish family that also lived in Highland Park. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, remark that, well, here we are. Uh, Highland Park, all the Jews sitting at one table. I looked around, it's true. It was Marcia, uh, her dear friend, Ann Goodman, uh, now Ann Kahn. Uh, and uh, a couple of three others. Uh, and there we were, the only Jews in the room sitting at one table. Um, but now back to the reason. The reason, uh, and this is uh, a, uh, I don't know if anybody's really studied this problem or come up with a solution was that we all joined BBYO. Age 14, I joined AZA, and uh, that was virtually my life uh, until I went off to college. And the same is true of, uh, well, most of my cohorts are not with us any longer, uh, and uh, most of uh, Marsh's are in the same situation. Uh, but uh, we uh, girls joined BBG, boys joined AZA, and uh, that was our lives. Uh, I played football uh, for a few years, uh, so I kind of had one toe uh, in, in the other, uh, in the, in the uh, you know, to use the common word, goyish camp, right. uh, but it wasn't a big deal with me. I became more and more involved with AZA. Uh, and mainly because uh, none of the cheerleaders would go out with me, but the girls in BBG would. Uh, so um, I, uh, uh, that was my life. Uh, every afternoon after school, uh, I would uh, join my AZA colleagues and we would uh, either play poker or bridge or touch football or work on AZA stuff, planning for the next party uh, or whatever business uh, uh, active hormone uh, intensive minds can conjure up in those days. 
so that was it. Uh, and the same I expect to a large degree was true in Dallas. Uh, we segregated ourselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, in college, the same segregation was maintained. Uh, there were three Jewish sororities, A.E. Phi, Delta Phi Epsilon, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, oh, God, my niece will kill me. Uh, oh, Sigma Delta Theta, SDT, yeah, I think mm -hmm. that was it. There were uh, four fraternities, A.E. Pi, Sigma Alpha Mu, Tau Delta Phi, and Phi Sigma Delta. Uh, they were the nibblers. They were all the rich kids uh, from Houston or wherever. Uh, but the rest of us were just, you know, mainly, uh, we, we had all, you know, I was down at the lower end, of, way low end of the economic spectrum. There were guys in my fraternity that uh, were uh, uh, in the upper reaches too, but uh, it was very, very egalitarian. Uh, I, uh, that's why, I, that's why I joined, uh, and my family, uh, when I was growing up, uh, we had a roof over our head, we had groceries on the table, uh, but that was it. Uh, my father had a two week vacation every year and we spent it driving to Brooklyn to visit his family. So, you know, we never really, uh, and he was worked a lot. In fact, a whole lot, it finally killed him. Uh, so he was never around uh, for myself or for my brother. Uh, my mother uh, did her best, uh, but uh, uh, we only had one car and that mainly ended up in front of, uh, in the parking lot at my father's store. Uh, then I, once I got my driver's license at age 14, uh, I would uh, sometimes drive him to work and come and pick him up in the evening. Uh, my mother drove, but uh, it was uh, a hair-raising experience for all concerned. Uh, we had this giant old 53 Packard, and she'd drive it down the middle of the street at 20 miles an hour, and God help anybody that got in the way. Uh, but uh, anyway, we were not wealthy. Uh, so I had to uh, uh, earn my own spending money, uh, buy my own clothes, uh, both of which were very important. And uh, so I tried the best I could, but, uh, you know, I was always nicely dressed and I did get some good home training from my mother. Uh, you know, so uh, I managed to get by in society. Excuse me, I'm talking too much. Um, the, uh, but, you know, I didn't have money for you know, anything else. And uh, I, I've always kind of resented that, I'm sure, uh, unfairly to uh, my parents, but that's, that, that's getting too personal. Anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll take a breath there to let you go. Your memory is serving you very well. Uh, the BBYO was clearly a major impact on your life, as it is for many uh, Jewish kids at that age. Um, sounds like more of a social uh, experiment than anything. And I do want to get back on somewhat of a timeline with your education and the beginning of your career, but maybe share one more story or two more stories, either about BBYO or the education that you had and specifically what you major in and, and take that track, if you don't mind. Um, uh, again, this may be a bit long winded, but I uh, decided, no, never mind. I'm going to skip that part. Uh, moving on. As I say, I was a midterm high school graduate uh, and only wanted to go to the University of Texas. University of Texas offered you the option of taking a, uh, their own entrance exam. Uh, or taking the uh, SAT, is that right? Um, so I opted to take the UT exam, uh, went up there, it was on a Friday, uh, I guess I skipped school or whatever, but went up there on Friday to take the exam and I'd been invited to uh, uh, an AEPI uh, formal, you know, I was, I'd 
they know my intention and been rushed by uh, some uh, AE Pies, uh, you know, knew well, knew that's Fernie I wanted to go. But anyway, I accepted the invitation and uh, took the exam. Uh, wait, it was on a Saturday morning. So I went up on Friday and got wasted at the uh, pre uh, formal party the night before. Um, took the exam Saturday morning with a horrendous hangover. Uh, I managed to uh, place out in a couple of courses so anyway, but uh, the uh, formal is uh, uh, probably the highlight of my life. Uh, as I say, I went up there from Houston. I must have rented a tux or borrowed one. Went and uh, uh, met this girl uh, who uh, just struck me as the most beautiful person I'd ever seen. Uh, she had a date with a, uh, a full pledge uh, and uh, she wasn't having a great time and I wasn't having a great time despite the excitement of the occasion. And uh, we got to talking and uh, I got to liking her more and more and asked if I could uh, see her again, communicate, whatever. Well, turns out December 7, 1941, uh, I uh, never uh, went out with another woman. Uh, I, you know, I had a few dates that you know, didn't were meaningless, but uh, I never was interested in another woman. To move the story forward just a little bit, uh, thank you, BBYO. Uh, we both went to the regional convention in El Paso uh, in December of 1957. And uh, on the way back, uh, I arranged, we were on the train, I arranged to sit next to her on the train. Uh, and so as I joke with my kids, uh, yeah, I slept with your mother the second time we went out. Uh, and you know, they looked at me in horror. In fact, I, I, I said that at the 50th anniversary, our 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, but uh, anyway, I woke up early, early that morning on the train and she was sleeping next to me. And I looked over and looked at her in that early morning sunlight and said, you know, I wouldn't mind waking up next to her the rest of my life. And that's what happened. Uh, we got married. Uh, well, let me talk about my education. Uh, I had wanted to be a lawyer since I was, I guess, 11, 12 years old. And I'll skip that story. But the uh, University of Texas had a program where you went to undergraduate school in the College of Business Administration for three years, took the required courses, and then you could get into law school. And since all I wanted to do was be a lawyer, uh, I figured that was the way to go. Uh, I turned down uh, plan two because it required four years and I would have had to take it a foreign language, which I hated. Um, so off I went uh, to the University of Texas in the College of Business Administration. Uh, and uh, time I got through there, uh, I uh, was missing two required courses, and uh, this was must have been 1962. So I remember I was wandering around Austin uh, in the, the rain from the backlash of Hurricane Carla, uh, and uh, no, it must have been 61, yeah. Uh, wondering what in the hell to do. I couldn't get into law school. I couldn't, and any interest, didn't have any money to go back to undergraduate school. So I said, yeah, I'll take a chance. They went up to see Dean Keaton, Dean of the Law School. And, uh, you know, he had an open office and, you know, just knock and walk in. So I did. And I told him my story. I said, Dean, is there anything I can do? And he said, well, you know, what was your LSAT score? And I told him, he said, you're in. I'll take a chance on you. Uh, make up those other two courses sometime before you graduate from here. So that was my law school education. Uh, did reasonably well, had a solid B average. Uh, and uh, 
I finally finished the two courses that I was missing by uh, correspondence my senior year. Uh, Marsh and I got married at the start of my uh, second year of law school, 1962, August 19, 1962. Uh, of course, I was still in law school, so we set up a house in uh, Austin. She got a job with the uh, Texas Comptroller of Currency uh, working in the basement doing something, I don't remember, the basement of the Capitol uh, for about a little over 200 bucks a month. Uh, she had a uh, degree in journalism from the University of Texas uh, that she also finished in three years so that uh, we could get married. Uh, I guess we both had good hormones at the time. I graduated from law school, uh, got a job in, uh, with a small firm in Lubbock, uh, and uh, when it, we moved out there, which turned out to be a disaster, uh, our oldest son was born there. That's about the only good thing I can say about Lubbock. You know, there's an old song, you know, the greatest sight in the world is Lubbock in your rearview mirror. True. Uh, the, uh, anyway, we, I had a job offer uh, from a, uh, or through a former uh, roommate and fraternity brother of mine. Uh, who was in the patent law department at Texas Instruments to come to work as, at Texas Instruments. Uh, so I said, hey, you know, I'd been avoiding wanting to live in Dallas because uh, I didn't want to get bogged down with Marsha's family. Um, she got more cousins than the crown prince of Saudi Arabia uh, and, of course, her parents. Uh, I didn't want to get bogged down in that. But anyway, I said, okay, look, you know, we got a kid, uh, I need, we need to get out of Lubbock. This pays good, uh, let's go. So we moved to, uh, we moved to uh, Richardson, which was near the TI campus and took a duplex. Um, and uh, I realized not long into my tenure at uh, Texas Instruments that A, I knew nothing about what it was that they did and B, that I was not cut out uh, for the corporate life. So I left uh, Texas Instruments in uh, 1966 or 67, I'm not sure. Oh, wait a minute. See, so we moved here, Charles born in 66. So it must have been about 1968 that I left Texas Instruments. I'm sorry that the dates are flagging on me, but, you know, that's... Uh, you know, I'm surprised I remembered to get up this morning. But in any case, uh, that was right around JFK. Where were you? Oh, yeah, when that's a good. JFK happened. Good point. That was my senior year in law school. Uh, it was on a Friday afternoon. He was coming to Austin that night, and we were scheduled. You we were planning to go see him at the Austin uh, Municipal Coliseum. Of course, uh, he never made it. Uh, that was our uh, that was our uh, JFK moment. Uh, we uh, watched in horror along with the rest of the nation on our little black and white portable TV that my parents gave us as a wedding present. Uh, but it really, uh, you know, we we grieved and we scratched our heads a little bit and wondered about all of it. But we didn't, I don't think either one of us was you know, devastated or thought of this as a, a world changing event or anything else. Uh, you know, we just went on, Marshall went back to the basement of the comptroller's office uh, and I went back to uh, law school. And we went on with our lives. Uh, and it didn't prevent you from moving to Dallas. So not, not at let's, all. let's double click. Let's expand on the family tree and the okay. Dallas. I know you were living in Richardson. Uh, it sounds like you had at least one son. Uh, maybe you could talk about him and his name and, and any other children. And then just where you lived in Dallas and whether you were involved with any Jewish organizations in the 60s and 70s, maybe okay. 80s too. Our oldest son, Charles, as I mentioned earlier, was born in Lubbock in 65. 
uh, our second uh, child, a son also, Craig, uh, was born in 68 at uh, Presbyterian in Dallas. Uh, I remember I didn't have health insurance at the time and I had to give him a mortgage on him to bail him out of the hospital. Uh, then our third child, Laura Ann, uh, was born in 1971. Yeah, I kind of joke that uh, uh, they were all born in the first two weeks of May. Uh, the joke was that uh, our anniversary was in uh, late August. So, you know, count nine months. That, that, that was what my birthday present was every three years. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, they all, uh, from kindergarten on, attended Green Hill. Marsh and I made the choice uh, at the outset that we wanted our kids to have the best possible uh, education and decided that uh, uh, Green Hill offered that best opportunity. Not that we could afford it, but we managed to uh, scrape up the money. Uh, briefly, uh, Marsha had both her parents living uh, and uh, three, two of her uh, her, her uh, maternal grandparents uh, lived on for a while after that. You know, we spent a lot of, not a lot, we spent some time with them. And <coughs> as I said, she had uh, more cousins in the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. She had big family, uh, both her parents. So she had a lot of first cousins, so we interacted with them. She was the oldest of that cohort. so. You know, many of them were just annoying little kids at the time. Uh, we lived uh, in this duplex in Richardson for, I suppose, a year. Because I remember, uh, we, uh, yeah. And we bought another house. We bought a, our first house in Richardson, uh, which I wish I still had. Uh, it was a, a real, it was a bargain. It was very nice on the south side of Beltline. Uh, and uh, east of Coit. Um, we lived there until uh, 1974. And then we bought a house in uh, Highland Park on the west side of Highland Park, which is not in the Highland Park School District, but in the city of Highland Park. <coughs> it's on Edmondson, three blocks south of uh, Mockingbird. Uh, and that's pretty much the house where our kids grew up uh, going, going to Green Hill. It's not that you know, we had any uh, qualms about uh, going, to going to integrated schools. Indeed, Green Hill uh, had a few uh, diverse kids, black, uh, Hispanic, uh, Asian, uh, so they had some exposure, probably more than they would have had uh, in public schools. So that was not, it was never an issue with us. The quality of education was, and the Dallas schools at that time were you know, appalling, just to uh, give them a compliment. Uh, they were wrestling with the integration issue and uh, paying attention to nothing else while you know, their uh, population base move to the suburbs uh, to avoid uh, integration. In uh, 1984, uh, I was uh, doing very, very well financially. Uh, we bought a uh, Bud Oglesby house uh, on, uh, off Straight Lane, just north of Walnut Hill, a couple of blocks from Ross Perot. Uh, and uh, lived there until, uh, well, I'll come up to that later. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it was featured in the Dallas Morning News and, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. We used to see Ross Perot riding his horse around the neighborhood. And I would let my dogs out to go chase him. Uh, it was very nice neighborhood, very nice. We had, we had lived a luxurious life at the time. Uh, that was, uh, I think, Charles graduated from Green Hill, 65, and 18 would be 83. Uh, he also turned down a uh, Plan 2 full-ride scholarship at UT 
decided he wanted to go to Brown. Uh, he was a uh, excellent, uh, uh, outstanding soccer player. So he and he wanted to play soccer at Brown. So you know, I could afford it. That's where you want to go, son. Go. Um, so off he went, which is probably now I, I, I won't say that. It's too personal. Um, in any case, uh, one of the uh, Charles I talked to him last night. He said I should mention that we have uh, the distinct honor of uh, having had uh, Abraham Klein uh, stay with us when uh, he came to referee the uh, finals of the uh, Dallas Cup soccer tournament, which still goes on today. It was in its early years, and I think this was maybe number five or number six. Abraham Klein, if you're you know, a soccer aficionado, know is uh, uh, refereed uh, two uh, World Cup finals and he's from Israel and a very distinguished uh, person in, uh, in that milieu. We had that honor and uh, he left us the, the game ball you know, from the Dallas Cup final autograph, which uh, Charles now has and wishes he could find somebody to uh, take off his hands. But in any case, uh, we were a soccer family. All three of our kids played uh, and uh, we all three, uh, that, that took up a lot of our growing up lives, uh, our family lives. Uh, none of our kids was interested in BBYO at all. Uh, they uh, just had their own circle of friends. Charles, of course, was married to soccer. Uh, Craig, uh, I uh, really, I don't know what he did. You know, he was a middle child. He just slid through the system without anybody paying much attention to him. Laura, of course, as a girl, uh, gets, uh, you know, when she was born, uh, she became the uh, queen nice. bee. Yeah. Uh, so all she got all the attention, and uh, except for her brothers who tormented her endlessly. You know, they had a game they called Dick Budkus after the Chicago Bears linebacker. They would use her as a football to play. Dick Butt, because I'm not sure what the rules were. But anyway, uh, that's uh, my law practice uh, to cover quickly. As I mentioned, I uh, decided that the corporate life wasn't for me and that I never wanted to work another day that I didn't sign my own paycheck. So I left Texas Instruments and went into uh, the law office of Anal Cornbleth. E M I L C O R E N B L E T H. Uh, he was the distinguished Jewish lawyer, uh, whom there were very few uh, at the time. Uh, it was him and uh, uh, Louis Hexter, and uh, what was the other guy's name? I can't think of it. Anyway, Mr. Cornbleth trained all of the next uh, cohort of Jewish lawyers in Dallas. Uh, Morris Jaffe, who was uh, another very distinguished Jewish lawyer, Harold Abramson, uh, Manny Hoppenstein, uh, Arnold Sweet, uh, oh, God, the list goes on. And uh, so I was pretty honored to get to go into his office uh, with the understanding that it was eat what you kill, uh, but he'd give me enough uh, game to kill to make a living. Uh, so I went into his office and I suppose he taught me how to be a lawyer. I, I didn't know coming here from Sikkim uh, about it at the time. I knew some law, but I had no idea how to practice law because I had absolutely no mentorship or training during my short tenure in Lubbock. Uh, it's, you know, I still have nightmares about picking juries in uh, West Texas. <laughs> uh, I didn't get along with juries in West Texas. But uh, anyway, that was uh, from Ms. Cornblatt's office. Uh, I was asked to join a uh, firm that was organizing uh, young lawyers about my age. Uh, and uh, we formed a firm and <clears throat> took offices in what was then the Kirby building 
is now, I think, some kind of residential condo at 1509 Main. Practice law there together for a couple of years, and then ironically moved to uh, 1200 Main Street, uh, where I now live. Uh, but we had offices there. Uh, the firm dissolved, and uh, I uh, had built a pretty good. Uh, I had uh, taken, uh, not that I lured him away, but it picked up some clients from his Cornwest office. Uh, he was declining in years, and uh, I had done a good job for those clients. So I picked them up and uh, picked up some other clients. Uh, oddly enough, uh, having beat them up at the courthouse, uh, they decided they want me on their side next time. So I picked up some business that way. And you know, I had picked up uh, some individual type business while I was at Texas Instruments doing wills and you know, uh, getting traffic tickets quashed and uh, did have one major, I was after I left TI. You know, I couldn't have done it while I was there, but uh, anyway, that's how my practice grew. Uh, Mr. Pornblith was the go-to Jewish lawyer in Dallas. Uh, he represented uh, a good percentage. You know, if you had a legal problem, you went to Emil Cornblith. And of course, a lot of them were you know, minor nitpicky things that you know, he felt I could handle. Uh, so I got to handle them and did an incredible job and the clients were appreciative and you know, paid their bills with a fair degree of uh, uh, regularity. You know, so I was making a living and getting along and, you know, uh, but, you know, he would never commit to when uh, it was to become Cornbleth and Fishman. So I said, look, you know, I want my name on the door. These guys came along and wanted to make it Fishman, Rosenberg, whatever. Um, so I did. Uh, it, it was a decent enough association. During that time, as one of my practice highlights, uh, I had uh, been hired by the uh, ACLU to uh, bring a congressional redistricting case to uh, set aside the uh, redistrict congressional districts uh, from this 1970 census. I think they brought it to me uh, because every other lawyer uh, who might've taken the case turned it down. But anyway, uh, it was uh, uh, Bob Strauss that probably sicked them onto me. Uh, Aiken Gump Strauss. You know, Bob was uh, very close to LBJ and uh, to uh, you know, all these. You know, he was a he was a power, real power guy. Um, and uh, he sent me some other stuff along the way that uh, his uh, white glove firm didn't want to, you know, take off their gloves to handle. But I was handy in the same building, and uh, they knew I wouldn't embarrass them too badly. Uh, so anyway, I got this congressional redistricting case uh, in which I filed a lawsuit to declare that uh, districts unconstitutional and substitute new boundaries. And when you uh, challenge the constitutionality of a state law, uh, you invoke a, you know, in federal court, you invoke a three judge court, uh, which consists of uh, one judge from the Fifth Circuit in two district judges. So anyway, we can be in this three judge court. I had any idea what the hell I was doing, it, but um, I went up there and, uh, and I put a lot of work into it. My client, uh, Dan Weiser, was the nominal plaintiff, happened to be a mathematician uh, at, uh, I think it was at Mobile or maybe its predecessor. Uh, uh, so he was, you know, he, the numbers were his life. So he worked out all the disparities between the districts and uh, did all the, uh, all the heavy lifting on the facts. Uh, I did the heavy lifting on the law and we went down to argue the case in front of this three judge court. And lo and behold, they ruled in our favor and said the districts are unconstitutional and here's what we're gonna do instead. And uh, the horror, it was just, you know, the whole political system went nuts. Uh, and uh, so uh, Lloyd Benson hired a uh, professor from uh, Yale Law School to uh, take the case to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
the court granted cert. So there I was sitting in the courtroom on in January of 1972, 73, it's been 73. Uh, in fact, I was sitting there, ours was the first case up uh, when they announced the uh, decision in uh, Roe versus Wade. Yeah, I had absolutely no idea of the significance of the case. You know, my whole head was in my case and I didn't have, the world could have been on fire around me. I wouldn't have known it. But anyway, I argued my case, the Supreme Court agreed with me and affirmed the declaration that the, the, that the districts were unconstitutional that remanded the case, the district court to uh, see if they could find a less drastic remedy uh, which which they did. And, and anyway, that was one of my practice highlights. I really uh, enjoyed uh, doing that. Uh, in later years, another practice highlight. I'll, I'll, let me yeah. just let me interject for a second and just say it's amazing how much our careers affect our lives and our families' lives. And if you may, um, I, I, want, I don't want to miss anyone in the grandchildren bucket if you can just comment on any of the grandchildren you have and maybe come back to the jewish community a little bit and just mention how it has changed over the decades and then we can end with anything else you want to discuss okay uh my grandchildren i have three my oldest son charles has two uh will uh is the oldest he lives in san diego he's a uh a firefighter and EMT. Uh, his daughter Scout uh, lives in New Zealand. Uh, she is trying to break into uh, uh, television, you know, not in front of the camera, but uh, her degree is in uh, electronic communications. And then my third uh, grandchild, uh, Cole, uh, is the son of my second son, Cole, uh, Craig. Uh, he is a uh, sophomore at uh, Baker University in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Kansas. Uh, he's there on a golf scholarship. Uh, very, very athletic family, and 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 you mentioned well, it, it, it's odd because uh, you know I played football, but that's just how much punishment you can take or inflict. And Marcia was never an athlete. Uh, and I have absolutely no idea. Uh, Charles was an amazing soccer player. He's an amazing baseball player, too, and probably could have had a professional baseball career, but he was stuck to that damn soccer ball, so he never, he never did. Craig is a, uh, uh, has his own business. Uh, uh, he owns a uh, uh, garden and landscape company in uh, Kansas City. Uh, Charles works for some kind of tech firm. I honest God don't know what he does. Uh, and my daughter, Laura, is uh, and has been in Los Angeles, uh, I guess, for over 20 years now. She just bought uh, her own house. Uh, and she's quite proud of that and justifiably so. She is uh, in branding which has something to do with your name and image. Uh, she is a consultant. She also uh, signs her own paychecks, uh, but uh, works through uh, uh, several you know, branding agencies that, you know, that when they need her expertise on something they call her. Uh, but uh, they're all, uh, they're all re relatively successful. Uh, Craig's business is doing well. I really don't know what Charles, you know, uh, uh, he and his wife divorced after having two kids. Craig and his wife divorced after having one. Um, but uh, Charles lives in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, Craig lives in uh, suburb of Kansas City. As I say, Laura lives in Los Angeles. Are they, are they active in their Jewish communities? I mean, I... I Laura I has, um, uh, she'll, she'll go to services or occasionally, like on uh, Marsha's yard site, she'll watch uh, Emmanuel services online. 
uh, Charles and Craig have no uh, uh, interest in religion. Uh, our uh, con uh, our family life, uh, you know, they, uh, I, we, Marsh and I insisted that they have exposure. So we belong to Emmanuel. Uh, we went to uh, services on the high holy days. And uh, of course, when they were all, all on the bar mitzvah circuit, we went to a lot of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Uh, they, uh, Charles and Craig both had bar mitzvahs. We insisted on that. Uh, we gave Laura the option of having a bat mitzvah uh, uh, that, or, or being confirmed, and she chose confirmation, so she stuck that out. You know, I suspect that. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I don't comment on that. It's not necessary. Uh, as far as involved in the Jewish community, uh, that was pretty much Marcia's uh, life. Uh, she was very, very active in the National Council of Jewish Jewish Women served on the board and was president for two terms uh, and uh, continued on until her health failed, uh, being on the, uh, being active with the NCJW. Uh, that also uh, led her to being active in uh, just about every Ilya Mocenary organization in Dallas uh, and rose to leadership positions in those. Her philosophy was to uh, 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 give your time and money locally and let the rest of the world take care of the rest of the world. And she stuck to that philosophy. Uh, we, uh, neither of us was much interested in working the uh, Federation uh, give me money circuit. Uh, we went to a few Federation fundraisers over the years and of course donated every year. Uh, but that was uh, about the extent of it. Uh, uh, you know, I spent probably an inordinate amount of time earlier talking about how the Jews disappeared uh, from public life. You know, that continued on into adulthood. The vast majority of our friends uh, were, were Jewish. We just felt more comfortable with them. We had non-Jewish friends, Marcia, peddled residential real estate for 20 years. And, you know, she made a lot of friends in that community. So we had some friends that we went out with and that uh, she, when, when she was doing the ladies who lunch routine, she would go out with them. Um, but, uh, you know, we pretty much fell into uh, a pattern that started at age 14. And I don't know really about the rest of uh, the, Jewish community of our cohort, but it seems to me that uh, whenever I get invited to somebody's house for dinner, uh, the rest of the company is Jewish or, you know, there are occasional exceptions, uh, uh, but uh, in large part, you know, it's people you know and may have had dinner with two weeks ago. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, again, I don't... Uh, I don't know that this is a pattern. I don't know that, you know, maybe we're just uh, too lazy to work at it. Um, you know, we had, as far as I know, absolutely no prejudice uh, whatsoever against uh, 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 people of color. Indeed, uh, since Marcia died, uh, I've become very good friends with uh, an Indian couple that uh, until I sold my house in August of last year, I uh, lived across the street. Uh, we, and we still uh, have dinner and get together uh, frequently. Uh, they're, you know, delightful people. Uh, I, uh, the only uh, African-American or black friend that I have uh, is a, uh, well, I don't want to accuse him of doing anything illegal, but he hangs out every night on the corner of Maine and Ackard uh, and uh, we become friends. We stop and chat. He's a cigar smoker, as am I. So, you know, that's the only black person I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've uh, never had a, a black partner. I've had Hispanic colleagues, uh, and I don't think I've ever had an Asian colleague. Uh, but 
Yeah. Well, with the world the way it's going, I think the Jewish community will continue to be inclusive and diverse. And, and especially as Dallas grows, I think it's just a natural evolution to mix with others. And, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. I, I think... Like the Hasidim did? Right. S say that again? Like the Hasidim do? Or the ultra-Orthodox? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, what part of the Jewish community is growing? It ain't... Uh, it's not the reform. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, you might want to rethink that premise. Yeah, no, I, I think... I don't mean to be... <laughs> I don't mean to be contentious. No, it's just there, there's clearly challenges, and we need to get kind of the middle-aged and the youth more engaged and more involved if they want to be. But I also think, especially with kids my age, there's a lot more interfaith marriages, and we have to try to uh, include everyone. But um, where it goes is only time will tell, I guess. Well, but, my kids tried interfaith marriages twice and flunked out. Uh, but yeah, we, we're getting too serious here. Uh, yeah. Let me show you, you, you know, one of the questions was, what are you, some of the things you're proud of? Yeah. You know, that is my foray to the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, I got to go back you know, years later and second chair my brother uh, when he argued a case. But uh, I am also a uh, author. I have written four books. I'm going to pick this up and see if I can bear. I love it. I can see him. Well, let me get see if I can get a little bit closer. Uh, anyway, there's... Are they there. related to the law or they're more fictional? Uh, they're all fiction. Okay. Uh, I usually, let's see, uh, two of my protagonists are lawyers. And uh, one, the last one, El Chupacabra, uh, is set in pre-pandemic contemporary North Dallas and uh, features uh, it, all of them are, are, are mysteries and you know, the, the bodies stack up in varying quantities. Uh, but uh, El Chupacabra is the one that seems to have resonated mostly with uh, people that... Uh, I know, uh, although, uh, you know, they've all read the books and uh, enjoyed them, and I still get a uh, royalty payment every month from uh, Amazon, so, you know, can't complain. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping to write another one, a sequel to uh, El Chupacabra. But, uh, I don't, you know, I thought about, you know, I've read, uh, I, I, I guess if I do anything in my spare time, it's read mysteries and thrillers. So I know the genre, I would think, pretty well. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wrote El Chupacabra with a Jewish lawyer protagonist uh, who uh, would, uh, you know, he could match uh, wits and uh, fisticuffs with uh, any of your fictional detectives. Um, and I had uh, uh, actually uh, uh, the uh, story is about him uh, solving the mystery of the death of a Jewish accountant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all the, uh, 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 all the characters, principal characters, except mm -hmm. for uh, two are uh, Jewish and those two are black. No, wait a minute, I do have a, I do have a, uh, uh, non-Jewish female police detective. Yeah, those and we can find all these books on Amazon if we just search yeah, for your Lawrence Fishman. Lawrence movie. Fishman. We got it. And we can do a separate call sometime if you want to spend more time. I know an hour is not enough to talk about all the accomplishments and the history, but you're clearly... Uh, you're clearly maybe, a, maybe some of it, Rick, I don't want to talk about. Yeah, well, there's that aspect too. But um, I, I think for now, I think we should wrap it up. We can always do more, but there's a lot to be proud of here. The community is very thankful for you and the Fishman family uh, and, your, and your membership over the years. But really, your stories will hopefully be archived forever for future generations to watch and to relate to. 
And uh, is there anything else you want to add before we end? No, I, uh, I hope that I uh, fulfilled your expectations. That's, you were that's excellent. Really all. <laughs>